Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. I'm glad you can have that you're with us tonight. Our guest tonight is Francis Burford with the Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative. But before uh, I start chatting with uh, Francis, we've got our own Dean on the line with what's new in the world of drugs this week. Good evening, Dean. How are you tonight? Well, I'm good. Uh, how are you guys doing? I, uh, I, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, speak with your viewers. We, uh, I think, are making great strides. I'm looking here at a website I use quite often, mapinc.org, M-A-P-I-N-C.org. A great site, yeah. Yes, sir. And, and I'm looking down through here. At, uh, I, I looked up the word heroin because I want to talk on it here in just a moment. But under that category, there's 50 uh, entries that show up, and about 47 of them are talking about progress, about countries that are beginning to uh, allow heroin use within their country, and a lot of letters to the editor. I would uh, venture to say three-quarters of them calling for the end of prohibition an adoption of the LEAP mentality, the Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, I am a member of LEAP, and we're a group of about 6,000 uh, uh, current and former law enforcement officials, as well as others who have joined with us in calling for the end of prohibition. And uh, the countries I'm talking about, just in the last few weeks, that have uh, allowed the distribution of heroin and other drugs to addicts under, um, you know, control, medical supervision, and the nations I'm speaking of are not the Netherlands or Switzerland who have done similar measures, but uh, some of the, the powers of, of our planet, Germany, uh, Great Britain, and Canada. And I, I think it's time for us to stop and think about it. If these countries can dare to do this and in so doing lower the incidence of crime in their country and uh, help bring about a, a more regulated and controlled marketplace, perhaps it's time for the U.S. to consider doing a, a similar measure. I want to point out that this uh, past week, Ed Rosenthal uh, had his second trial for uh, distributing medical marijuana as an officer of the city of Oakland. Well, it's not a trial. He had a hearing. He's uh, going to go further uh, later this week I think, uh, within that. And uh, it indicates that uh, thus far the indications are that he's not going to have any further convictions and that what it's really going to do is to disrupt the DEA's ability to go after the uh, marijuana distributors out there. Uh, if, if I may interrupt you for just a second, sure, please. Uh, to remind the viewers that uh, the city of Oakland asked Ed several years ago to help supervise some means of getting state legal medical marijuana to its residents. The feds uh, charged him with unlawful distribution under federal law. They prevented the jury from hearing anything at all about the medical uses or his relationship with the city, and he was sentenced to one day in prison. And Which this was right. a he, he had already been in jail that one day, so it was for time served. Yes. And Ed challenged it. He appealed the decision. He didn't want that conviction on his record because he was doing as his... Uh, his uh, local government had requested, yes. and he d he is not a criminal and didn't want that on his record. And the Ninth Circuit agreed with him and reversed the conviction. Yes. Yes, sir. And uh, Ed will be uh, one of my guests this week on the uh, Century of Lies show. That's on KPFT Radio 90.1 FM. Also on that same show, I, I have an interview I'm doing with Dale Geringer. He heads up the California Normal uh, organization, and he recently had a letter published in the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, talking about the 100-year history of the drug war in California. They actually had a head start on the United States. They started in 1907. Right. And, and, and we talked about how it had the racial and, uh, you know, bigotry involved in uh, going after the Chinese in particular and then how the pharmaceutical board out there uh, kind of grabbed the reins on this and ran with it and uh, really started the... Uh, the gang wars, if you will, the violence the associated with uh, drugs, having nothing to do with drugs, more to do with control of their distribution. 
and uh, uh, Dale will be uh, another guest on the Century of Live show. And this week on the Cultural Baggage Show, I will have Jack Cole, who recently had a debate with a U.S. attorney. And uh, I will be putting a video online tomorrow at drugtruth.net, which is my website, and we'll be using a portion of the audio this week for the Cultural Baggage Show. Um, I want to say hi to uh, Frances. She's been very instrumental in getting my uh, getting me uh, 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 speaking engagements at various churches in the Houston area, and I will be uh, preaching at the Galveston Unitarian Church uh, sometime in May or June coming up. And uh, I think it's important that we challenge the morals of these drug warriors. They're the ones who want to keep funding Osama bin Laden. They're the ones who want the cartels to thrive. They're the ones who want the violent gangs to be able to purchase their weapons with money derived from drug sales. And they're the ones who, who want all of this madness to continue. And I think we can win this by uh, taking on the moral challenge, if you will. If folks want to learn more about the work I do, I urge them to please visit our website, which is drugtruth.net. Listen to KPFT Radio 90.1 FM every afternoon at 420 for the Drug War News. And on Friday at 1 o'clock for Century of Lies, and on uh, Friday at 7 o'clock for Cultural Baggage. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, uh, Dean. And while I've got you on the phone, I want to ask your opinion about something. Uh, sure. This year, I've noticed that there are quite a few states with legislatures looking at uh, medical marijuana. In addition to Texas, there's at least New Mexico, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Connecticut, uh, and and my sense is that there seems to be somewhat of a synergy building with with all of these things and people talking to each other and seeing what's happening around them. Uh, do you see something like that happening as well? I do. I, I feel there is kind of a, a uh, I, I don't know, a revulsion to, if you will, the lies that have been proffered by the federal government for so long, the medical data that's coming forward, uh, the just abundant, every study that's ever conducted proves that the, the government has been lying about the properties of marijuana. And I think there are a lot of baby boomers who have been through uh, certain aspects of this drug war who have decided, well, heck, it's, it's not going to ruin my career. It's not going to hurt my chances at re-election, and I want to stand for the truth. And I think we're just seeing a lot of people willing to stand for that truth. Okay. Thank you, Dean, and I'm glad you could join us again on this show. Well, thank you so much, y'all. Keep up the good work. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dean mentioned a website, Map Inc. M A P I N C dot org. Uh, it's one I also use all of the time. Among other things, they collect uh, newspaper and press stories on drugs, including columns, op-eds, letter to the editor, uh, from all around the world on drug issues. Uh, it's a marvelous place to keep up with what's going on in the world, so I recommend it to you uh, if you're interested in knowing what's going on in other places. Now, tonight we have with us... Uh, as I said, Francis Burford, who among other things is with the Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative. And welcome, join us tonight. Thank you. I'm and glad to be here. I think I'm going to call you Francis because with That's my fine. name being Buford, your name being Burford would just confuse me. That Francis is fine. Okay. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, uh, I've been interested in tying the religious community yes. to the drug policy change. Okay. And I think you may, you know, why, why the religious community particularly? And uh, for one thing, it's been said that history is most changed by social movements with a spiritual foundation. So uh, this is, we, we need a spiritual foundation to substantially change the, the drug laws. We need a critical mass of religious support. And I think that's particularly true in America, where so many people cite moral values as an important consideration in deciding how to vote. And secondly, it seems to me that many people oppose reform 
because they believe that the illegal drugs, like principally marijuana, cocaine, and heroin, are immoral in a substantive way that other drugs are not. Now, I don't okay. believe that, but I think people have that idea. These are immoral drugs. These are yeah. bad drugs. We have to fight them. So, I know that, that's something that I run into in talking to people all of the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought a good place to start was with the religious community when I okay. decided after I retired to work on drugs. Mm -hmm. And I began with my own denomination, Unitarian Universalism. Okay. And as a result, uh, in 2002, the, our General Assembly, which is like the, the, the conference for the uh, with representatives from all the denominations uh, voted a policy, Unitarian Universalist for Drug Policy Reform, uh, and among other things called to establish a legal regulated and tax market for marijuana, remove criminal penalties for possession, and um, make all drugs legally available with a prescription by a licensed physician. There's quite a bit more. And if you're interested in the entire statement, uh, there's a website, uudpr.org, and at the bottom of the home page you can click. I don't know if they can zoom well, in on that. Let's see if we, to, we can get a uh, camera get on this. Over there or not. Close enough to get it. Uh, okay. My rather UUDPR.org. And uh, at the bottom of that home page, there's a little place you click and. You've got three choices of various formats you can bring uh, up. That we've got that thing. as well. Yeah, that okay. one. Well, I'll talk okay. about that in a okay. minute. Uh, this this comes up. This is for Internet uh, Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative, and that website www.idpi.us was formed. Be, so that we could reach out to more denominations. Okay. Well, uh, the Interfaith Initiative uh, has it spread much further than the, the UU. Absolutely. That was that was the purpose okay. to, to spread beyond that. And uh, although there's no other denomination quite as opposed to the current American drug policy as the UUs, there's a lot of support across the entire spectrum of religious denominations. Uh, for example, there are 20 denominational bodies that advocate repeal of mandatory minimum sentences, right. including American Baptist Convention, Union for Reformed Judaism, a U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Uh, supporters of med medical marijuana include United Methodist Board of Church and Society, the Progressive National Baptist Convention, and six others. And if you need more, this is the site to go to if you would like to find out how your denomination stands on these issues and other drug policy related issues. You uh, get to that website. Well, I know uh, in the past several years, uh, particularly on the Republican side of the agenda, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the religious right and their somewhat doctrinaire, moralistic stance on several things. It sounds to me like you're taking a different approach here. Well, I don't know that we've made as much inroad with the religious right. Yeah. Uh, the IDPI has done a survey of many religious groups, and um, the evangelical Protestant groups right. are among the least likely to right. support any of these initiatives. Yeah. But there are many church leaders using religious doctrines and biblical statements to oppose the drug war. And I pulled off a couple that I'll read from, read uh, excerpts from. Okay. If you, uh, if the you... Reverend Arnold w. w. Howard of Enron Baptist Church in Baltimore, okay. Maryland. Uh, we need to take a little break now. Oh, okay. Uh, but when we come back, uh, we'll read a couple of those and discuss them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I believe that they're just about ready for a break now. Am I right, Steve? Okay. Sometimes when we have a problem, we only use one tool. It works pretty good most of the time, so we keep on using it. Pretty soon, when your only tool is a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. 
With prisons overflowing with nonviolent drug offenders, it's time to try some new tools. Drug prohibitionists beat the drum for more jail time, but that has been a self-defeating policy. If someone has a problem with drugs, they need medical help, not incarceration. The drug war is doing more harm than good, and it's time for a change. By reducing the consequences of prohibition, we can deal with the real issues involved in a rational drug policy. There are better tools. If you would like to help reduce the harm caused by the drug war, please visit our website at dpft.org. The jury right to say not guilty is an essential safeguard against injustice, which dates back to English common law and the founding of the United States. Jurors in early 19th century America routinely refused to enforce the Alien and Sedition Act, and they rejected the Fugitive Slave Act. Jurors in early 20th century America refused to enforce alcohol prohibition. The injustices of the war on drugs have become obvious to many Americans. In cases where the law, prosecutorial excesses, and the likely sentence seem manifestly unfair, jury nullification ensures the citizen juror a more equal status with those who write the laws. Please visit the Fully Informed Jury Association, FIJA.org. Please keep such decisions private. Nullification is your right, your responsibility, perfectly legal and just. Welcome back. Uh, tonight we are discussing matters concerning drugs and religious outlook on them with uh, Frances Burford, and she was about to give us some quotations from other religious leaders concerning these matters. Uh, but before she does, I want to remind you that our phone lines are live, and we welcome your calls with either comments or questions. Uh, this is your show, and we'd love for you to participate. Now, uh, you were about to tell us I'm what some other people... I'm about to read from uh, a statement by Reverend Arnold W. Howard of Enron Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he's, uh, to quote, Jesus said, you judge a tree by the fruit it bears. It is no surprise that our punitive approach to drug abuse has bared the fruit of chaos on our streets, insanity in our classrooms, and delusion in the halls of Congress. As if drugs aren't a bad enough problem, we don't need our drug laws ruining lives, too. He says our society has become addicted to the drug war. It's time for an intervention. The first intervention he feels should be made is medical marijuana. And I like this quote, if we are going to have a war on drugs, can we at least remove the sick and dying from the battlefield? Uh, he also feels we should restore educational opportunities. This refers to the fact that uh, anybody convicted of a marijuana uh, can, uh, of any drug any, offense. Any, dr any drug yeah. offense yeah. is no longer eligible for financial aid. Uh, federal financial aid. Federal financial, financial aid. aid. Mm -hmm. And also the most crucial issue, he feels, is mandatory minimal, mi minimum repeal. Uh, he says it's only fitting that faith groups which are committed to reducing drug abuse and the harm associated with it should be, are the ones calling for a drastic shift toward policies that seek to heal and not punish. I pray that we will all gain the courage to chart a new course toward healing, compassion, and love. So that comes from a leading Baptist minister. Well, I think uh, one question, it's, uh, I've heard several things where church leaders all across the country have spoken out similar to this, but what kind of responses do you get from congregations on it, from just regular church-going people? It depends upon the congregation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't have statistics about okay. percentages of the right. various congregations Right. I was thinking more of, of point. your own uh, feelings as you've talked to people and uh, dealt with them. Or, the people I talk to in mm -hmm. my in my denomination okay. are, are very much uh, open to 
most policy changes. Yes. Sometimes total legalization is a little harder, but even <laughs> so, even so, there would be a fairly strong voice yeah. in uh, my denomination well, well, I know, for uh, drug legalization. You know, looking just at my own history as I became involved with these issues, so I first started out by saying, well, you know, these laws maybe are a little too stiff, but we need to do something right. about it. And then I went through a stage where I was thinking, well, gee, you know, marijuana is not so bad, but we still need the laws against those horrible. Right. And now I find myself in the position that I don't really care about the drugs themselves as such. My view is that prohibition laws themselves poison society much worse than any drugs do. Well, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And so let me let me read you okay. what a Father John Clifton Marquis uh, wrote in the U.S. Catholic in 1990. This is a long time ago, and he says the drug laws are a moral issue. Fifty years of drug legislation have produced the exact opposite effect of what the laws intended. They have created a tantalizingly profitable economic structure for marketing drugs. The moral issue here is to do the very best that can be done to give the community maximum control over drug availability and consequently, consequent drug use. Uh, he can, comes out, and I can't quite find this quote in this long thing, he comes out for drug legalization in this yeah. paper, which I was very surprised about. <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the position of the entire Catholic Church, well, however. No, but I think it's, it's a very strong tradition in Western morality in general. Yes, Absolutely. That moral issues are matters of conscience and should be left to the individual to make up their own mind. And then, the, then moral suasion should be on an individual basis. It can't be something imposed by law. So I, I think that there's probably a strong foundation for the thing he's saying there. Well, I think he, he feels more, that may be part of his feeling, yeah. but I think it's also the fact that the drug laws themselves have actually caused immoral acts. They've taken oh, money, yeah. they've taken money from uh, projects that could be worthwhile, educational reform, mm -hmm. spent it on prisons, mm -hmm. made the United States the number one in, uh, country for incarceration, and uh, so oh, I think that that's, I think when, that is yeah. the, mo the no. I think that's the great immorality no. of the drug laws. Oh, at, the, at a time when, for one thing, we're worried about money to pay for rehabilitation for returning injured soldiers, Absolutely. when we're worried about money for education, where health care is probably the biggest concern in the country. Estimates are about probably 40 billion, with a B, dollars a year spent on drug laws and their enforcement, and that's not including incarceration expenses. So. Right. That's a lot of money that could be spent in other ways. Absolutely. And the immorality uh, done to uh, families of people that are in prison for drug laws mm -hmm. and uh, the, the hardships that they encounter, the ch number of children who are orphaned by the drug laws mm -hmm. and so forth, all of those are uh, immoral things that are happening and they're directly attributable not to the drugs, but they're mm -hmm. attributable to the drug laws. That well, I, I no, noticed a story today. Uh, the state of Georgia, the legislature, is looking at their laws concerning police no-knock uh, searches and raids because of another situation in which the police burst into the wrong apartment, mm. shot and killed a woman, and basically said, oops, we're sorry that happened. So we've got the case of the young man uh, believe down in Horton where there's a discussion about whether or not he was killed wrongfully in a no-knock drug raid. So yeah. yeah, I think I think that we have to look seriously about the moral issues involved with the laws and their enforcement. Uh, 
I also had brought with me an NAACP press statement. Now, all of these things come from that IDPI uh, website. dot US yeah. website. And uh, to quote, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 21.3, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And it goes on to say, talk about mandatory minimum sentencing. And I'm sure it's been said in this program many years before that uh, minimums can be viewed as the new Jim Crow laws of our country. Uh, while African Americans make up approximately 15% of the drug users, we make up 37% of those arrested for drug violations, 59% of those convicted, and 74% of those sentenced to prison for drug offenses. Where is the justice? Right. And that is directly contravenes any and, statement for, in yeah. the Bible for justice. Speaking of mandatory minimum sentences, looking once again at the federal system, uh, the average nonviolent drug offense in federal law draws a longer sentence than murder or rape either one in the which federal is, system. Uh, which is uh, really a topsy-turvy situation. It's, it's very topsy-turvy, mm -hmm. yeah. and it's a very topsy-turvy. The particular drug that we choose to prosecute is is rather topsy-turvy as well. <laughs> well, uh, uh, there's a lot. Many of the r religious statements that I looked over in preparation for this do are that many of the religions are opposed to the mind altering ability yeah. of drugs although some of the some of the faith the, the Quakers feel that way but yet they also oppose the violence because of the drug laws right. and so yeah. they they would feel that it's up to each individual to but, uh, but there are some differences here uh, for instance, I know the, the Latter-day Saints are quite strict on mind-altering drugs and don't allow themselves to use caffeine. That's right. And yes. caffeine is a stimulant just like cocaine. Yet I've been in many a church fellowship hall where the coffee urn was chugging oh, away merrily. And it certainly is. And yeah, and mm -hmm. in our, in our UU churches, that's, the, <laughs> that's always there. Yeah. Uh, but I have I've wondered now that many of the prescription drugs, and I don't know it's very much about this, are mind-altering drugs. Uh, well, it, it goes back to something you said earlier when you said that a lot of people looked at marijuana and cocaine and heroin and classified these as evil substances. But uh, what we're seeing, especially with the prescription drugs, is that opioids are all the same and it doesn't matter whether it's illegal heroin right. or prescription morphine or Vicodin or codeine once it's in the body it's all the same and the problem is the more we've tried to use these dare type programs and nonsense like that to tell kids heroin is bad don't do heroin when they know, gee, you're not supposed to pick up a dirty needle and stick something in your arm, they don't see anything wrong with swallowing that nice, white, safe Vicodin tablet they found in Mama's medicine cabinet. Right. Uh, they haven't been taught that drugs can be used or misused. We've tried instead to teach them heroin is the devil, and Vicodin that your dentist gives you for a toothache is okay. Right. And they're the same thing. That's right. Well, you know, the uh, Unitarian Universalists, or the, the Unitarian Universalist for Drug Policy Reform, which is at UUDPR, uh, yeah. .net, uh, I'm sorry, UUDPR.org website, uh, uh, that organization has developed a very wonderful drug education problem program for mm -hmm. young people and it talks about drugs in a truthful way it talks about exactly the kind of things that, that you mentioned yeah well I know uh, I've and if anybody's interested they can go to that I, website I, and find out more about that drug education program it, it's it's probably worth uh, 
worth looking at. Uh, one thing I've noticed in a long time of dealing with kids is, believe it or not, kids can look at the real world right. and deal with facts. So uh, I believe they're trying to tell me it's time for another break. Okay. So let's wrap it and see what we have to say. Uh, if somebody ever comes around you talking to you about drugs, run away from them. You understand what I'm saying? Run away from them. And see, I got these drugs that I want to talk to you guys about. I have a whole lot more to tell you about. I don't have a whole lot of time. I got these guns. I have a gun on my side right here. Just this week, at the beginning of the week, a young boy, not even 16 years old, was killed because he was playing with a gun. And see, this is an unloaded gun. Right here, this is a gun. No, empty weapon. Empty weapon. This is a Glock 40. 50 cent, too short. All of them talk about Glock 40. Okay, I'm the only one in this room professional enough that I know of to carry this Glock 40. I'm the only one. <laughs> No, everybody all right? You all right? Stop, this is false. Yeah, that's an AV. Yeah, I'm in. Listen, listen up, guys. But, um, listen up. And I'm going to listen to you. So listen to me. God, listen to me. Yeah, listen to me. See that high accident happen? It can happen to you, and you can be blown away. Okay? So God, never play with guns. See how accidents happen? They happen. Okay, now I'll probably never ever be able to show guns again. But Brian, show, bring that up and that, Brian. Before the break, you were telling us, among other things, that uh, UU has a fact-based drug education program yeah, for it's children. Actually, I should, it's not the uh, congregation, but Unitarian Universalist for Drug Policy Reform, UUDPR. Okay. And uh, you put that website up a couple of times. It's right up there, UUDPR.org. Okay. And they have developed a very much fact-based drug education program aimed at hmm. oh, high school high school okay. age students is this more for use in groups or for it, it's, individual it's definitely or? for use in groups okay and there are a lot of group activities they have mm -hmm. things they have ways to get high without drugs <laughs> okay like dancing yeah. doing math problems <laughs> which i like a lot because i was a math teacher well but, i'm I'm a former math major, so I can understand <laughs> that, but we're no, but probably the minority. But there are a lot of ways. Yeah. There are ways that appeal to everybody. You don't need drugs well, to get high. But this, this program uh, talks about the effects of drugs the, yeah. so that if somebody experimented, they know what to expect. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's a very, looks like a very good program. Well, one thing that's been of concern to me lately, uh, a lot of the material I look at seems to indicate that children that have trouble with drugs as opposed to children that experiment with drugs normally start showing signs of behavioral problems by the time they're eight or nine years old. Uh, they start probably experimenting very, very early with tobacco and alcohol. Right. Uh, do you know if... if any kind of outreach is being done to 
work with parents to tell them to, to look at their kids early on before drugs show up in the picture? I, d I don't know, and I guess part of the problem would be finding parents. Many of the kids yeah. who are in trouble perhaps don't have parents who would oh, be yeah. easy to reach. I think part of it is uh, last for six or eight hours a day, so, so they're somewhat captive, but there's a, a real lack of education for parents. And they seem to be much harder to, to communicate right. with. Uh, I know in this program they okay. encourage parents to kind of be, I think they're part of yeah. some of the lessons and so forth. That would not help yeah. with children for a nine-year-old. And I, I think there have been some call to develop a program for younger kids, but it's a big undertaking. Yeah. And so it, it is. It's a major to, project. But yet. I think by the time they're in high school, uh, most of the kids are well into the experimental right. stage at least. Uh, are there, there places that if groups or congregations wanted to go to get more information about participating in any of these activities, they could, well, yeah, other than I, these I, websites? I, yeah. Well, I don't know other than the okay. website. I, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think the, uh, the program is quite that, that far along. Okay. But it, There's yeah. the, uh, the the work by Marsha Rosenbaum, and that's featured part of the part. Some of these lessons talk about okay. that: how parents talk to their kids mm -hmm. about drugs, which okay. is again emphasizing a very honest yeah. approach. But what I was uh, starting to say earlier, it seems very upsetting to me that people who are maybe selling a few drugs to friends, and I don't advocate that at mm -hmm. all. Uh, will get punished very harsh, harshly, and yet some of the pharmaceutical companies that are selling drugs to millions of people, <laughs> some of which have very bad outcomes, yeah. get maybe a little slap on the wrist, mm -hmm. but usually not even that. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, part, part of this goes back to evil drug versus good drug. Exactly. And to popular misconceptions about... Uh, how evil drugs are sold and and really when it gets down to the kid level or actually to the individual user anywhere it's probably not a professional drug dealer they bought them from exactly. they probably got it from a friend mm -hmm. who's sharing with them or dividing it up and sharing expenses uh, there are exceptions I had a friend who in some ways was a professional drug dealer by the time she was in the seventh grade. Wow. Uh, and I think there's a lesson there. Her, yeah. her bet was on the way to school she would buy a bottle of no-dose, sell those pills to the sixth and fifth graders to get high on for about 50 cents a pill, take the money she got from that and buy Ritalin for her to get high on from her classmates. Uh, so this was a case where by the seventh grade uh, we have a professional drug dealer, but, but normally they're higher up on the chain and they never enter into these transactions with kids. Uh, the shady character lurking on the school ground corner, he's, he's a matter of myth. Well, right. They, yeah. Uh, but you mentioned Ritalin, and of course that's being prescribed. To yeah, many children. Three, three to five million school and kids a that, year that, that's something which has upset me and mm -hmm. doesn't make sense when we talk about morality and yeah. drug laws mm -hmm. uh, I had a student who did a pretty good paper for me a few years back on riddle and there's no doubt that it's overused in some cases there's certainly no doubt that classroom teachers and principals should not be in the business of prescribing riddle and that's a doctor's <laughs> job but there are quite a few kids that do benefit from the provision of a stimulant. And what the studies have shown surprisingly is that the kids who are properly diagnosed and treat have less incident of involvement with illegal drugs or drug abuse later in life as opposed to those who were under-prescribed. And, That's very interesting. Yeah, one, of, one of the other problems is that 
because of its availability and because of its effect, Ritalin has become another one of these prescription drugs slipping the, the fence line. And the, right. One of the most popular drugs of abuse among the teenagers and college age crowd. The point is there isn't a good drug or a bad drug and a moral right. drug mm -hmm. or a mor moral drug. There yeah. are uses, proper uses, right. proper places for drugs and improper places. Yeah, and, and, and I and think... the drug laws just wipe out all of those. The, the funny thing is we only seem to have recognized this in one place. And that's with alcohol, which right. more and more I'm thinking is by far the most dangerous drug we deal with. Well, but in that case where about two-thirds of the population uses alcohol, we do distinguish between normal use, which right. is the glass of wine when we get home to relax mm -hmm. or a drink or two at a party to, to right. loosen up from abusive use which is drinking and getting behind the wheel of a car or drinking and beating up your spouse and use dependency which is the alcoholic who continues to use even though the use hurts him and, and those three things are quite different absolutely and we don't recognize those distinctions with other drugs well, that's, that's very important it's also one of the uh statements in our statement of conscience for the Unitarian Universalists and yeah. the addiction, the people who are addicted to drugs need to be handled as a medical problem and not mm -hmm. as a law problem. Yeah, I'll, I'd, I'd go further and say that in many cases it's more than just a medical problem in that they also need, many of them are lacking in the social and job skills as well as having medical or psychological problems they need adjusting with but it's something that needs to treat the whole person and it certainly shouldn't be done in a punitive fashion and and that's Absolutely. the thing that that's the point yeah. it needs, mm -hmm. yeah. addiction needs care and treatment yeah. it certainly is not helped by by imprisonment right and where you they get nothing mm -hmm. and 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 to me, one of the things that shocked me when I found it first several years ago is that drug use occurs at about the same rate in prisons as it does on the streets, with one exception. In maximum security prisons, it's used at about twice the rate that they're used on the streets. So even even in prison, prohibition doesn't well, do a good I mean, job. Yeah. If you can't keep it out of a maximum prison, Security, security prison. prison. It's yeah. pretty hard to keep it off the street. I, I yeah. think that's. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing that I thought of, Dean Becker mentioned LEAP, Law Enforcement Against right. Prohibition, and that's something I'm involved in uh, getting speakers, uh, play, LEAP speakers placed in churches and other organizations. Most of them speak from a. Um, uh, perspective of morality yes and these are in many cases uh, people who have been on the line acting for the drug war and right. become disillusioned and I think are are feeling unhappy about things that yeah. they did and I'm, I know a lot of the leap speakers uh, speak from a position of we've been there we've seen it and it oh. just doesn't work well that's yeah. that's it but they mm -hmm. i've heard several of them and all of them that i've heard have said something about mm -hmm. they've in their experience they, they felt that they were had been involved in an uh, exercise that was immoral mm -hmm. and I, I think that both the organizations you're dealing with and leap itself law enforcement mm -hmm. professionals show that this idea of reforming the way we deal with drugs is certainly not just a fringe movement of California slackers oh, and, and drug heads anymore at all. Uh, so they're trying to get me to take another break here okay. and after we take this break we'll come back and okay. say some more words for our last segment of the evening. Okay. So we're talking with Francis Burford tonight uh, with uh, the Unitarian Universalist uh, 
actions on drug policy as well as the Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative. And we'll see you back in just a bit. Moving too fast to take time for the things you really enjoy? Positiva can help bring back the pleasure of activities you used to love. Some of the highlights of Positiva may include increased appetite, lower blood pressure, and significantly lower stress. People who take Positiva discover a whole new outlook on life. Positiva may not be right for everyone. Consult your physician today. Positiva. Now you have a choice, a positive choice. For more information, visit us online at www.normal.org. Visit normal.org today to learn how you can help end marijuana prohibition in 2007. Uproot the propaganda, not the plan. My friends used to make fun of me. They said that smoking weed made me no fun. I never wanted to go out and party and do the stuff that they were doing. Looking back, I'm kind of glad that I smoked pot. Otherwise, I'd be just like my friends. Drunk driving accounts for almost 20,000 fatalities a year, and out of all the drug-related deaths, marijuana has never accounted for a single one. Know the facts. Know the law. Normal. During the break, uh, our normal co-host, Banda Nears, slipped in to join us, <laughs> and I believe she's going to give us an update on what's happening in the world of Texans for Medical Marijuana. Yeah, thank you, Beth Buford. Um, I just want to give you guys a quick update of what's happening with Texans for Medical Marijuana. We've got, ha got a few changes, and we really need your help um, in order to secure the advancement of the medical marijuana cause in Texas. Um, we're taking little steps right now. It's HB 1534, which has been submitted and filed, and it just states that it's an amendment to the Health and Safety Code saying that uh, patients who have been prescribed and recommended by a physician will be able to use that as a criminal defense in court. So it's just an affirmative defense. It's not changing any criminal law. It's not changing any other laws. Um, so, you know, we're not trying to make any dispensaries or anything like that. We're just trying to take baby steps here in Texas. But um, previously, this bill has been filed in the Criminal Jurisprudence Committee, but now it is actually, you know, in the correct committee, and it's being filed in the uh, Public Health Committee. Um, and so, actually, one of our members here in Houston, a newly elected Ellen Cohen, is part of the Public Health Committee. And also, as a bit of personal information, her aides told us that she um, is a survivor of cancer for 37 years. So... Uh, Anyone who lives in District 7, I believe it is. I'm uh, not sure about the number. But yeah, I'm not sure. It's my district. It's the Montrose area it's in Montrose area, Southwest. Right. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And so if you're in that area, please give her a call. We really need her support. Also, anyone living in the Northwest area, um, Dwayne Bohack has previously said that he has been semi-supportive of medical marijuana stances in Texas especially due to some very adamant and persistent uh, supporters locally that we have here in Houston. And the only way of this bill being able to survive and pass is if we have him or especially him or any Republican uh, representative um, or senator actually supporting this bill. So anyone in Dwayne Bohack's area, please, and I, District 10, I think, I'm really not sure. It is in the northwest area of Houston, so check out the website is state.texas.us or something. I was going to say, do you know who the, who the chairman of the committee is? Uh, for the public health? Yeah. I'm not sure who the chairman is, but the, the problem is what's happened in the last few years 
is people in the calendars committee never putting it okay. on the table. And so locally here in Houston, the last person that, if you're in her district, uh, you really need to get off your chairs and go make that call and go to these offices. Debbie Riddle is, you know, continually blocking this bill from actually being voted on or from actually going to committee. And she is local here to Houston also. I'm not sure which area. So and as you were starting to say, uh, the Texas government website mm -hmm. has all of the senators, representatives, their addresses, mm -hmm. their phone numbers, uh, all of the information their you need. Websites, so. every aspect of info, contact information you need to go ahead and harass them as much as possible. So, yeah, um, that's our update. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we're hoping for as much support as possible. Like we said, you know, we need a Republican support um, for the bill. But other than that, you know, it's time to step up and make your say. And that's right. And on the same line, uh, on the federal level, Dennis Kucinich is the chair of the appropriate subcommittee, and he said he will be sponsoring a bill to make an exemption to the federal law for the states with medical marijuana laws. So contact Representative Kucinich for Ohio to express your support there. Thank you. How is that different from the Hinchy Rohrabacher Amendment? It's basically the same, I think. Oh, okay. But it's a new Congress, new chairman, <laughs> yeah. new chance. So, hey. uh, sure. And uh, Francis, do you have anything well, you want to add? Well, many things really are looking up. Uh, I gave uh, the technicians a sheet with two books that you might be interested in. If you, uh, the, uh, the, fir the first one listed there has two chapters by the executive director of the uh, Interfaith Drug Policy Initiative and gives quite a few statements about uh, from religious leaders and a lot of information. I believe they've got one off yeah, on the screen. Yeah, the Politics, Marijuana, and the Cost of Prohibition, mm -hmm. which is edited by a man named Early Wine. Uh, Michael Early Wine is either a psychologist or mm -hmm. a physician. He's a professor at one of the medical schools in the Los Angeles area. Mm -hmm. His earlier book on medical marijuana one is also, one of the classics. And that, right, one is also, that one is also listed there. Yes. But the, uh, the top one is the one that has, has the uh, chapters specifically yes. about uh, religious organizations and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, uh, my, my final message is that we need to spread the word. It's not the drugs that are immoral, it's the drug war. Okay. And I think that that's a message that can't be repeated too much. That's right. Uh, I, I get the feeling that the organizations that you're working with uh, work mainly through denominational organizations and tend to work more yes, top down. Yes, IDPI mm -hmm. does do that. Now, they yeah. had a uh, uh, representative go down to Nevada, and, and he yeah. organized congregations and ministers mm -hmm. and so forth. Uh, so, for the uh, legalization, if, if well, any, uh, quite a bit of work, yeah. didn't quite work. Yeah. If if any churchgoers are interested in what you're saying, then probably right. what they need to do is right. ask questions and put pressure they, on they their pastors get, and and work out. They can that get way. on that IDPI website and yeah. find out how their congregations feel about these various issues, and then they can start whatever type of initiatives. Uh, you can do in various churches. Okay. We, uh, I, I work through a, 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 a policy which has been set up in my denomination, and you just have to find out what you can do. Okay. And IT, IDPI would be happy to help. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, and I think like all good revolutions, mm -hmm. this one is more and more coming from the grassroots, from Right. People organize through their normal ways of organizing. Right. It's not something, it's it's a place where we're pushing the government off of our backs rather than expecting the government to take care of us. I think so. And as Dean Becker said, though, it looks things are looking up from several years ago. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel really much more rosy about mm -hmm. this year's legislative proposals across the country. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your feelings, Wendy? Well, Hinchy Rohrabacher, you know, we have that. You were just saying that yeah. Kucinich has that bill. It's been progressively getting more and more support. And uh, I do feel pretty strongly about the legislation that we have upcoming. Um, but also something Francis said, you know, 
we need to start talking about it. And I think talking about these issues and getting them out in the open is one of the first steps in grassroots organization. So I think it's definitely, you know, time for a change. Well, that's yeah. I think. But remember, uh, it's all up to you. Uh, more and more, I'm believing that the three most important words I know are those that start the Constitution of the United States, the ones that say, we the people. We're the boss. It's our government. But the government doesn't know that unless we tell them. It's up to you to visit your representatives, to call your representatives, to write your representatives, to email your representatives, to bug the hell out of your representatives and remind them that they work for you. And that's how you get changes. Before we leave tonight, uh, there's something I want to talk about. Almost two centuries ago, Lord Acton, the British parliamentarian, said that power corrupts and that absolute power corrupts absolutely. In our society, no power is more absolute than the power of the state over those who are incarcerated. It shouldn't come as any surprise then when stories of corruption like those now surfacing in the Texas Youth Council abound in correction systems across the country. The Texas Youth Council supervises the state schools in which youthful offenders who are mainly teenagers are locked up for education and rehabilitation. The stated goals of the system, it's not one of punishment. However, I don't think the legislature intended the program to include the kinds of sex and drugs education that those useful offenders seem to be getting. And one institution for boys, well substantiated allegations, claim that over an extended period of time, the staff members were having sexual relations with their charges. Although several staff members were fired or allowed to resign, and at least one case was referred to the local district attorney, no one has been charged or prosecuted. At one of the state schools for girls, staff members were allegedly not only having sex with some of the girls, they were paying the girls with pills, uppers and downers to quote the news stories. The irony of this report springs from the fact that a very large percentage of the crimes juveniles are charged with and supposedly being rehabilitated from are drug offenses. The stench of these incidents has gotten so strong that it's reached the state capitol, and all over Austin people are pointing fingers at each other, all claiming ignorance and all claiming that they did too tell the proper authorities about it. So far, the governor has <coughs> placed TYC in receivership and investigations have started. But let's remember Lord Acton. Let's also remember the California situation in which guards were staging gladiator fights among inmates and betting on the outcome. Let's remember Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo, uh, get, get Mo and Sing Sing before its major riots and the Texas prisons with trustees wielding axes. And how do we as people correct this? Corruption cannot stand the light of day. Open, transparent government where the people see what's going on is imperative. We must let the public and the news have full access to the prisons. This is the only way we can fulfill our responsibility. Thank you and join us again next time. Okay, and now we sit until... policy of drug prohibition is hopeless. It is hopeless. It will never get better. Literally, victory today is being defined as slowing down the pace of defeat. We ought to listen to science and medicine when it comes to uh, whether marijuana or any other substance has a medical benefit. The fact that marijuana is the less dangerous
a program that has failed and failed every other time we try. Please point out one success in 30 years of an eradication program that has stopped drugs from coming to this country. Point out one success, because I, I reviewed that research years ago.